Thank you for introduction to me. Um, let me switch a gear from the prediction to what's actually happening in China. Um, based on the specific scientific finding I found from the measurements of glycol and nitrous acid during hair Beijing mission. So before I jump into the story, I would like to thanks to my co-author who gave me the contribution to finish this work. And um, let me start with what care, care Beijing stands for. Uh, as you may know, care Beijing is a consecutive field mission happens from 2006. Uh, thank you. Uh, 2006, and I'm pretty sure Professor Zutong will give you more details about the care Beijing, what they found. Uh, so I'm going to only focus on the uh, findings from this mission uh, this year, uh, which was starting from June 2nd to July 9th in North China Plain. Actually, there was four sites uh, during this mission, uh, one in PKU Beijing and three other sites. So I'm going to only focus on the data measurement from Wangdu, uh, where most of the intense measurement was happened. And as you can see from the bottom panel with a lot of in international groups, it was actually a uh, very active international collaboration under the organization uh, ship provided by PKU. So at this site, the scientific question we want to answer is based on, uh, uh, it's related to the radical chemistry, like uh, the OH generation they see at PRD missions, or what are the major controlling oxidation chemistry uh, in daytime and nighttime chemistry, or some question related to the particle formation and the particle growth and CCN activities. So here I'm showing you an actual Google map of the uh, site. As you can see, the gray, uh, the brownish color represents the feed field, and the gray area represents the small town in this area. So the site is located in the middle of the wheat field, which is like four kilometers away from the city of Wangdu. Um, when you think about the North China Plain, Actually, it's a, exactly the same as this. It's a just zoom out, zoom out picture of this. So massive, we filled with small towns in um, those, those area. So this is the actual photo I took at the site. So basically, we filled with seven trailers with a lot of instrument in it. And there's a 20 meter tall tower for the meteorological parameter measurements. To answer the question related to radical chemistry and photo uh, particle formation, so there is a intensive measurement of various uh, parameters, starting from meteorological parameters for the chemically related species and uh, chemical and physical and optical property of aerosol. So due to the limit I have, a time limit I have, I'm going to only focus on nitrous acid measurement and glycol measurement I made at uh, this site. Um, so. Why am I interested in HONO? So Guy briefly mentioned about the importance of HONO. HONO is an actual uh, source of uh, OH radical by the reaction of photolysis. And it's been proposed HONO can generate it with the existence of, of NO2 with numerous pathway, but the mechanisms and the path and the rate are still controversial and unknown. So that is why I'm interested to measure the HONO at this site. And also, the reason I'm interested in glycol is because it is also a radical source when via the photolysis reactions. But the main reason I'm interested in glycol is because it can contribute to SOA formation. So here I'm showing you two drastic uh, uh, studies indicating different uh, amount of SOA glycol contribution to SOA. The left one is done by Rainer Verkma using their Mexico City DOAS measurement. And uh, as you can see from their DOAS measurement, which is shown as a gray box here, uh, doesn't uh, match with the model value, which is shown in black line there. So basically, they assume that red error, that magnitude of glycol shown as a red error needs to be uh, lost via SOA formation. So their conclusion is about 15% of total SOA mass can be explained by this one single molecule. But on the other hand, the work done by Rebecca, Wench Rebecca Washenfelder over Los Angeles Basin using their incoherent broadband cavity enhanced absorption spectrometer, they basically uh, observed, uh, they basically conclude that the measurement uh, agrees pretty well with the measurement. Measurement agrees pretty well with the model value within measurement uncertainty. So basically, there's not enough contribution from glyoxal to SOA. So to add a little more constraint on this issue, so I went to China where you can see the biggest glyoxal signal all over the world. With the instrument, uh, I brought an instrument called ASIS, which is newly built in NOAA. 
uh, called Airborne Cavity Enhanced Spectrometer. So see, uh, the ACES, the working principle of ACES is uh, CEAS technique, Cavity Enhanced Absorption Spectroscopic Technique, which has the advantage of cavity ring down and the WAS technique. By having, uh, by having a optic cavity like cavity ring down system, it can provide in situ measurement of species. And by having broadband light sources and spectrally reserved detector with a fitting scheme like the DOAS technique, it can give you simultaneous measurement of multiple species. So the current setup of ACES has two different LED channels here and there, uh, centered around 365 and 455 for the uh, measurements of NO2 and HONO or NO2 and glycol simultaneously. With the current setup, I can reach up to the, uh, the effective path length can be reached up to 3.3 or 18 kilometers, which enables like sensitive enough measurement for the ambient measurements of glycol and HONO. So at the site, I had two different inlets, but from now on, I'm going to only focus on the data from the high uh, inlet. Uh, here, I'm also showing you some of the general meteorological data during this mission. As you can see, the majority of the wind was blowing from northeast direction, and there was some pattern, diurnal pattern of wind speed and wind uh, direction, which indicates the regular meteorological setting at the site. And as you can see from temperature and relative humidity, it was pretty hot and humid site. So here, I'm showing you the time series I acquired with my instrument. As you can see, um, so the instrument has been up and running from the beginning of the field mission toward the end pretty well. And I'm, here I'm showing you from NO2, HONO, and glycol from top, middle, and bottom panel. So uh, during this field mission, there was a burning episode. As you may know, June, mid-June to July is the peak se uh, harvesting season of wheat in Ch North China Plain. So once they harvest the wheat, uh, they dry them out and they uh, burn the crop residue in, at night because it's illegal to burn. So every night in these periods, I start to see the fire episode and the, my instrument has uh, suffered from the sensitivity due to the cont aerosol contamination on my mirrors. So except those uh, episode, my instrument has been up and running pretty well. How bad was the uh, fires? So here I'm showing you two drastic picture I took. One I took right at the site during the sunny days just before the harvesting started. And the right one is one block away from the site. And I took the pictures right after the first day of burning episode. So even though there was any burning in this daytime, but there's massive um, haze during that days. So uh, I forgot one thing. And during the burning episode, the glycol concentration goes up to more than a PPB, which was about the same magnitude I observed during the mission in the United States. So as a first step of my analysis, I'm going to only focus on the sunny days from June 8th to June 11th data for the further analysis. So this is the dyno pattern I averaged over those four days of NO2 and HONO. As you can see, those give us very typical diurnal pattern, low during days and high at night. For NO2, it's like few ppb during daytimes goes up to 15 ppb at night. And I see non-zero non HONO signal. I'm not sure whether it's true or not. I have to uh, do a little more work here. But if that is a in steady state HONO, that contributes like 0.2 ppt per second in radical production rate, which is big. So uh, I, definitely there is more work need to be done to prove that whether that is real or not. So for glycol, uh, the co enhanced concentration ratio was observed during daytime and night, which is totally natural based on the uh, production scheme because it's a byproduct of oxidation uh, byproducts of oxidation of many different hydrocarbons. But interestingly, I see drastically the very distinct morning time peak, which is very different from the observation happens in the United States. Here I'm showing you one other example, uh, urban example uh, done over California in Los Angeles Basin during CalNEX 2010 mission. They see the maximum peak near around noon where the OH peaks maximize. But interestingly, I don't see that peak, but I see very distinct picture in their morning time. To understand the underlying mechanism of this morning peak, I built a little box model uh, to, uh, to explore that. So using the MCM chemical mechanism with uh, some observationally constrained parameters, and HO2 was my oxidant concentra constraint, 
and uh, I use small alkane and arcanes and ethyne and benzene, toluene and xylene and isoprene as a precursor of glyoxal. So in my model, I only have OH oxidation and photolysis as a loss process of my model. So th these three plots showing the result of my box model. So of ozone, formaldehyde, and glyoxal. So blue area represent the inoquartile value of the observation of the four days, and the bl blue circle indicates the median value of that. And black is the model result. Basically, my model can capture ozone and formaldehyde pretty well, but drastically overestimate glyoxal, more than factor of four. So if I assume that, uh, like what Reina Verkuma did, if I assume that much of discrepancy has to go some other loss process than OH oxidation, oxidation or photolysis, I assume that that mass goes to aerosol. And if I convert that number, uh, the maximum mass con contribution to SOA goes up to 2.5 micrograms per cubic meters. Um, and in terms of productions, isoprene and aromatics equally contribute to glyoxal formation, and there's non negligible amount of ethane production. And I ran a uh, few different uh, scenario models to understand, to explain the morning peaks. So here I'm showing you the black is the total model, including the total uh, precursor of glyoxal, and green includes the only isoprene case, and yellow uh, indicates the only anthropogenic VOC precursor case. As you can see, the morning peak is mainly driven by isoprene oxidation, which is surprising to me because the isoprene and OH peaks in the middle of day, like 12 p.m. at noontime, uh, but actually the uh, oxidation processes uh, to produ production to glyoxal peaks at morning. So that's one interesting thing I want to explore in the future. Um, if I compare that with other urban setting, LA, uh, it is interesting. So as you can see, um, China case and LA case, those pie chart looks identical. Isoprene and aromatics are important precursors and ethane is also important. But when you compare the production rate, uh, China is like 10 times faster compared to, the, uh, compared to LA case. But if, I, if you remember this uh, diner pattern I showed you, the concentration, uh, with the 10, 10 times faster production rate, actually I see maybe like comparable or a little less uh, quantity of glass over China. So that's another interesting question I want to answer in the future work. So as summary of my work, uh, I was able to collect valuable data set of NO2, glyoxal, and HONO from Care Beijing mission. Uh, I observed non-zero HONO, and uh, my model definitely overpredict glyoxal by factor of four or five. So more work needs to be done. I'm more than willing to uh, explore about the HONO signal and also quantified how much of the contribution to SOA from glyoxal loss process. And, and with that, I'd like to thanks to the science team during the mission and funding sources and more than willing to have questions. Thank you. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple questions from the audience. Maybe I'll start with this one. I know, oh. Same. Okay, please. So, we'll give you. Yes, in my box model, I have constant value of um, deposition throughout the time of, throughout the 24 hours. The reason is because I observationally observation constrained my precursors, so that was the last time I considered. So I definitely need additional one than the dry deposition. Right. The comment was whether uh, uh, there was a carbon correlation uh, during the burning episode, whether I have a correlation between CO and glyoxal or not. Um, I didn't uh, pursue this uh, 
okay, I did a very rough eyeball uh, correlation test, and there was a definitely increasing signal of CO and glass so in not only this fire plume, but the fire plume I'm analyzing from the U.S. field mission. There was a good correlation between those two. Uh, the second question is uh, based on the emission factor analysis, based on the enhancement ratio of CO and glass, so can I uh, per like compare that or not. So, so far I know there is only um, lab uh, measurement of glyoxyl emission from fire. There is no field data available, so I'm preparing that for the future. Okay, maybe last question. Yeah, short, please. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't include the first generation oxidation, uh, first generation product of glass. Uh, um, but uh, the reason I didn't include that is because uh, from my previous work with the Senex data analysis, it very, it's highly variable based on the NOx region. So I want to wait until what I found from that. And the second uh, generation thing is also not included, but I also wait, want to wait until I found. Okay, thank you. Thank you.